The world religions have many inspiring and uplifting aspects and are known for their ties to the supernatural. And oftentimes these things can seem very scary when you think about them. So we're looking at the religion of Islam again and listing 10 scariest things in Islam. Starting at number 10, we have the jinns. According to Islamic theology, jinn are invisible entities who roamed the earth before Adam the first human being was created. Now they were created by God out of a mixture of fire or smokeless fire. There are many types of jinn including those that can shapeshift, those that can fly, as well as ones that can resemble animals. And now it's been said that the jinn can see us but we can't see them and sometimes your pets can see them so they start acting really strange and they'd be staring at something and you're like... What are you looking at? Having no idea that they can see a jinn. Now what makes this even scarier is that sometimes jinn, depending on how they feel that day, can call out to you and they can sound like one of your relatives or close friends. Then there's the recording angels. Karaman Ketabin or the recording angels are also another pretty scary thing in Islamic belief. Not that the beings themselves are scary but what they do can sometimes leave a person terrified depending on what they actually do. So let me explain. So there's two types of recording angels and they record everything that a person does. Like I mean everything and not just like an overview summary of what they did or said but really a detailed in-depth report. It's the ultimate biography. So if you think about it, you just look back into your life at all the bad stuff that you've done, whatever it may be that Karaman Ketabin angels, yeah they recorded it even though you thought no one saw you or thought no one heard you and that's what makes makes this earn a spot on this list. Number 8 we have Dajjal. Now Dajjal is known as the false messiah so similar to Christian theology and also known as like a liar or a deceiver and in the Muslim world believers say that he will create a lot of destruction by lies and having supernatural powers. Other religions know this as the antichrist who will deceive the entire world. Now not just the fact that Dajjal is believed to be a master deceiver is what makes him creepy but even the description of him and his appearance can give you nightmares like the Dajjal will be blind in one eye. In Islamic tradition the Prophet Muhammad referred to Dajjal as Al Awar which means blind with one eye. Now the Prophet Muhammad said that Dajjal's right eye would look like a floating grape and its left eye will be defective in some way. Now certain Islamic traditions however depict Dajjal having one eye and the biggest fitna or the testing period in the history of humanity is associated with the jaw. Yeah, that's pretty creepy. Next up, we have the Munkar and Nakir. Munkar and Nakir, in Islamic belief, are two angels who test the faith of people who pass away in their graves. According to Al Asuna, Munkar and Nakir ask a person who dies who is their Lord and what religion they follow and who is the Prophet. And a believer would answer these questions, but an unbeliever cannot answer them. Now, those who are deemed righteous will say, of course, Allah or God and mention the Prophet Muhammad is a messenger and they'll be allowed to rest in peace until the final day of judgment. But those who don't answer or answer differently or who don't truly believe will continue being punished like while they're passed away waiting for the final judgment. Now it's like that pre-punishment phase. You know like when you do something really bad and your parents say to you, you know, wait till I get home to deal with you and you know that time that you're waiting for your mom or dad to get home to deliver whatever punishment they're going to be delivering. You know sometimes that period is more punishment than the actual punishment. Now it may not be that way in this scenario but the idea that loved ones may not be actually resting in peace can be a pretty scary thought. Next up at number 6 we have the smoke. Okay so among the major signs mentioned by the Prophet Muhammad is the smoke and Muslims believe that God refers to this event in the Quran saying this, then wait you for the day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke covering the people. This will be a painful torment and that's in the Quran Surah 44 verses 10 to 11. Uh, there's also a hadith where the Prophet Muhammad said, verily your Lord has warned you concerning three matters, the smoke that overtakes a believer like a cold and overtakes a believer and makes him swollen until it comes out of his ears. So just imagine for a moment it's all pitch black, you can't see anything and you're coughing, you're not able to breathe properly and your body starts swelling up and you're in so much pain 
and you can't make it stop. Very creepy. Halfway to number five, we have earthquakes. So we all know the effects that an earthquake can have, and what makes them so destructive is that no matter what structure you've built on land, it's no match for an earthquake. It definitely will collapse. Not to mention that earthquakes in large bodies of water are known to cause tsunamis. Now in the Hadith Bukhari volume 9 book 88 it says the hour will not be established till earthquakes will increase in number. So when you take a look at the stats between the 11th century to the 18th century there have been 64 earthquakes right and in the 19th century there have been 47 earthquakes and in the 20th century there have been approximately 319 earthquakes and and the 21st century, there has been approximately 380 earthquakes. So earthquakes definitely vary in magnitude and not all of them are deadly. However, Muslims believe that we are living in the end time signs right now since the increase of earthquakes is believed to be a major sign of the end in Islam. Yet no one is certain how much more the frequency of earthquakes will increase or even how much their severity will increase. Okay, moving on down to number four, we have the angels of death death. So let's get into this one. Naziat and Nashitat are two classes of death angels that are subordinate to Azrael who is the archangel of death. Now these angels are responsible for taking the souls of those who pass away. Naziats are ordered to take the lives of unbelievers by force and the Nashitats take their life away gently. So the question always is, is are you going to go swift and painless or is it going to be slow and painful? That's a creepy thought. Number three brings us to Iblis. Now Iblis in Islam is the name of the devil, which is a counterpart to the Jewish and Christian Satan. Now he's a demonic creature and he runs wild on humanity to spread evil and misery. And in some cases, the name Shaitan is used to refer to Iblis specifically. Now the time of creation, God ordered the angels to bow down in obedience before Adam and Iblis refused, say, saying that he was better because he was created from fire and Adam was created created out of clay. So because he acted so prideful and disobeyed God's commandments, God threw Iblis out of heaven and his punishment was postponed until the day of judgment. And Iblis, who became the ruler of the jinn and also became a jinn himself, he tempts people to do evil. And according to some Islamic beliefs, apparently only animals like donkeys can see Iblis. And Iblis sometimes appear as a human form to carry out certain tasks like recruiting other followers. So yeah, you may run into someone on the street and could be the devil. Number two is jinn possession. So I spoke about jinn before, right, in this episode. Now, it's one thing to see a jinn and to hear one, but it's another thing to be under the control of one. Now, not all jinn are evil according to popular Islamic belief. However, the scariest thing about the jinn who are evil is that they can actually possess human beings. Oftentimes, people who are possessed by jinns may not necessarily be in a whole lot of pain or look like how people look in the movies. However, individuals may get super angry or feel like they're forced to act in a certain way without being able to stop themselves. So exorcisms gotta happen, you gotta go through that whole process and some possessions definitely are very violent where people's eye colors change and other physical changes happen in their body. Definitely creepy. And the final scariest thing in the religion of Islam is hell or Jahannam is the ultimate punishment for non-believers. After the disbeliever is no longer under the punishment of Munkar and Nakir, their punishment will then continue in hell. But this time, they'll be alive and fully able to experience their punishment. Hell is described as being extremely boiling hot and the suffering will continue for disbelievers as long as God sees fit. And it's said that despite the intense physical pain experienced in hell, the worst of all the torments is people's separation from God. Muslims view the religion of Islam as having all the teaching that someone needs to live on the right path. And some of those teachings can be seen as scary for many other people. Here we have the teaching of Dajjal. Now Dajjal is also known as the false messiah. Muslims believe that he will cause great destruction by his deceptive powers. And Dajjal also is known to be blind in one of his eyes. But certain Islamic traditions depict Dajjal as having just one eye. Now it's taught that the biggest fitna or the biggest testing period in the history of humanity is gonna happen at the time of Dajjal. Now 
Number nine brings us a teaching of Iblis. Iblis in Islam is the personal name for the devil. He's a very demonic creature and he's set loose on humanity. He spreads evil and misery. Everything bad, pretty much. Islam teaches that Iblis's punishment is postponed until the Day of Judgment, and Iblis sometimes can appear in human form, and he does this to carry out certain tasks, like recruiting new followers. Jinn possession is at number eight. Now, not all jinn are evil according to Islamic belief. However, the jinn who are evil, that's the type of jinn that would possess a human being. But you know, oftentimes people who are possessed by jinns may not be in agony and pain and screaming and with cuts on their face and going crazy like in the movies. However, individuals, they may get really, really angry or feel like they're forced to do certain actions without even being able to stop themselves. So there's varying types of jinn possession, but this is one of those teachings in Islam that can get pretty scary for some people. Next up is the teaching of hell. Hell is the ultimate punishment for non-believers according to Islam. Hell is described as being extremely hot, like People are going to be boiling there and there's going to be a lot of suffering and it's going to continue for disbelievers as long as God sees fit. Now it's said though that despite the intense pain that people are going to be experiencing in hell, the worst of all their torments is going to be realizing that they're separated from God. Moving on to the teaching at number six, this involves Munkir and Nakir. Munkir and Nakir in Islamic belief are two angels who test the faith of those who pass passed away in their tomb. Munkir and Nakir, they ask a person when they pass away who their Lord is as well as what is their religion and also who is their prophet. Now a believer will answer these questions according to the Islamic belief. Now unbelievers, they cannot answer these questions. But there are people who are going to give an answer but they answer in a different way or some of them actually don't even really believe what they're answering. Those are going to be the ones that will continue to be punished while they're in their graves. And their punishment while they're in their graves is going to last up until judgment day when they get their final punishment. Moving on to number five natural disasters. Natural disasters, according to Islam, are believed to be warnings for those who are sinners. Or in the Quran, you're going to find one passage that says this, and verily, we will make them taste the near torment, the torment in the life of this world, disasters, calamities, etc., prior to the supreme torment in the hereafter, in order that they may repent and return. And you can find this, by the way, in Surah 32, verses 21 in the Quran. Next up at number four, I want to talk about Gog and Magog. The people of Yajuj and Majuj, also known as Gog and Magog, are said to be very wild people. They're extremely vicious and they like to destroy things like crops and trees and buildings. Pretty much just everything in their path. They'll destroy people if they get in their way. According to Islamic teachings, there was a righteous man known as Dhul Karnien and he made a barrier which to this day has blocked the way for Yajuj and Majuj to come out until the day that they are going to be released from this barrier. But the teaching that is kind of scary about this is that only God knows that day. It could happen anytime. The next Islamic teaching that we're looking at involves Kiramin Katibin. This, by the way, is an Arabic term that translates to honorable scribe in English. These are two angels called Rakid and Atid, and they sit on human shoulders pretty much. I don't know if it's literal or symbolic, but what they do is that they write down everything that a human does or says. Now, on the Day of Judgment, each person's book of deeds will be be read and in that book every small and great thing is recorded in there but one thing to note though is that all the actions before adolescence they're not included now over in the Quran it says this that day the people will depart separated into categories to be shown the results of their deeds so whoever does an Adam's weight of good will see it and whoever does an Adam's weight of evil will see it that's taken from 099 verses 6 to 8 the teaching at number two is the Daba 
The Daba, similar to Christianity, is referred to also in the Bible as the beast. Now, the Daba, though, is generally thought of as a creature that will appear during the end times, and it's one of the major signs of the day of resurrection in Islam. Now, the role of the Daba will be to pretty much distinguish the believers from the non-believers. This beast will have the power to light up the faces of the believers, and you'll be stamping the faces of disbelievers. The beast also will be seen for the first time after the sun rises over in the west instead of the east. And the final scary teaching is a teaching of the smoke. When you look at the Quran, Surah 44, verses 10 to 12, you're going to find a passage that says this, Then wait you for the day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke, covering the people. This is a painful torment. Our Lord removed from us the torment. Indeed, we are believers. It was also mentioned in the Hadith that the Prophet Muhammad described the smoke as a peaceful wind causing all the believers to die. So in a way, they're being protected from the torments of the final hour. For the disbelievers though, this is gonna feel like a huge punishment for them because, you know, it will be a great punishment for them. Now the Quran makes multiple mentions of angels. For the most part, Muslims believe that angels were created before humans just for the purpose of carrying out the orders of Allah. As well as these angels, they communicate with human beings. Angels are immortal beings and they're made out of light according to the religion of Islam. And some of them also have wings. They're very pure, they cannot sin, and it's believed that they have no free will. And they always obey the will of God. There's also the supernatural belief of fate coming in at number nine. The Qadar meaning fate or predestination is based on four things in the religion of Islam. There's knowledge like for example the knowledge that Allah knows what his creations are going to do simply because he's all-knowing he knows what's going to happen he sees the future. The second is writing like for example like Allah has written the destiny of all creatures. There's also the will and that pretty much is that what Allah wills happens and what he does not will does not happen. Nothing happens in the heavens or on earth outside of his will. And the number four is creation and formation. For example, the belief is that Allah is the creator of every single thing that exists. And this of course includes people who follow the will of Allah and they do their actions in a real sense and he is the creator of them and of their actions. The belief of heaven comes in at number eight. So according to the Quran, Jannah is paradise and it's a garden of everlasting bliss and it's a home of eternal peace. Now the term paradise sometimes is used synonymous with heaven, although heaven does have other implications in the religion of Islam. Like for example, there's a belief that there are seven heavens, like the sky is considered a heaven or outer space is considered a heaven. But for this belief, I'm referring to heaven as it relates to paradise. Muslims believe that it's really up to Allah to decide who inherits heaven or hell at the judgment. So based on how well you lived your life on earth will determine where you go. Either you go to one of the levels of heaven or not, you may end up going to hell or Jahannam, which I'm gonna be talking about next. Hell is at number seven. Hell or Jahannam is the ultimate punishment for all those who do not follow the will of Allah. Now, according to Muslim theology, disbelievers in the grave, they're actually punished as well, but their punishment will continue in hell. But this time, they will be alive and fully able to experience their punishment. Hell is described as an extremely boiling hot place where there is suffering and the suffering of these disbelievers are going to continue for as long as Allah sees fit. Now it's said that despite the intense physical pain experienced in hell, the worst of all of the pains that are going to be felt by these disbelievers is a separation from God himself. Number six brings us the belief in the return of the Mahdi. Now in Arabic, Al-Mahdi means the guided one. Now this being is sometimes referred referred to by Shia Muslims as Sahib al-Zaman, and that pretty much translates to the Lord of the Age. But pretty much in simple terms, the Mahdi is 
almost like a messiah or savior in the religion of Islam. So let me explain a little bit more. The Mahdi is someone who's gonna rise up and launch an entire social transformation across the planet in order to restore as well as modify every single thing under divine guidance. So similar to other Abrahamic religions, Jews are waiting for the Messiah and Christians are waiting for the second coming of Jesus. But Muslims actually are waiting for both the Mahdi and Jesus to return. And they work hand in hand with each other. At number five, we have the belief in the jinn. Now the jinn, according to Muslim theology, were created from smokeless fire. The jinn are beings that Allah created before humankind, and the jinn, unlike angels, actually have free will, similar to human beings. So therefore, some jinns are believers and others are disbelievers. Over in the Quran, Surah 72 verses 14, it says, and some of us jinn are Muslims and some of us are disbelievers who have deviated from the right path, and whosoever has embraced Islam, then such have sought the right path. Now we can't talk about Whoa. angels and jinn without talking about the ultimate enemy, the devil. So Iblis in Islam is the personal name of the devil, which is comparable to the Jewish and Christian Satan. Now he's a very vile creature, he's a jinn as well, and pretty much his job is to spread evil and misery across the planet. At the time of creating human beings, God ordered all the angels to bow down in obedience before Adam, the first created human. Now Iblis, who was of the jinn, he refused to bow, claiming that he was much greater and nobler because he was made out of fire, but Adam was made out of clay. So because of this prideful act and disobeying this command from God, God cast Iblis from among the presence of the angels. But Iblis's punishment though is postponed until the judgment day. Iblis, aka the devil who became the ruler of the jinn, which is also referred to as the shaitan, he tempts people like I mentioned and causes misery around the world. It's also held by Muslims the belief that Iblis can sometimes take on the form of humans to carry out certain tasks and even recruit followers. Witchcraft comes in at number three and I do got to clarify though that this one is a little bit different because it's acknowledged by Muslims as being a real thing but it is actually not to be practiced by Muslims. So learning witchcraft and practicing it is a sin in Islam. In Surah 2 verses 102 it goes as follows and they followed instead what the devils had recited during the reign of Solomon. It was not Solomon who disbelieved but the devils disbelieved teaching people magic and that which was revealed to the two angels at Babylon, Harut and Marut. But the two angels do not teach anyone unless they say, we are a trial, so do not disbelieve by practicing magic. And the end part of that passage says this, except by the permission of Allah and the people learn what harms them and does not benefit them. But the children of Israel certainly knew that whoever purchased the magic would not have in the hereafter any share. And wretched is that for which they sold themselves if they only knew. Supernatural belief at number two relates to the Kaaba. So according to Islamic tradition, there are actually two Kaabas. It's often referred to as the frequented house or a house which is situated on the seventh heaven, which is directly above the Kaaba on the earth. So one's up there, one's on the earth. And apparently angels travel to this Kaaba in the sky, similar to how Muslims conduct the Hajj pilgrimage every single year to Mecca. Now the Kaaba on earth is actually a replica of the one up in the heavens. It's believed that angels perform prayer there and every single day thousands of angels visit it. Now this practice of them visiting the Kaaba in the heavens is going to continue until the day of resurrection. And finally, the supernatural belief at number one one in this episode is exorcism. And now jinns and unseen beings can actually enter human body physically and haunt them mentally, causing a lot of pain and torment for them. But normally in Islamic exorcism, the possessed person lies down while a very skilled therapist, they place their hand on their head and they recite verses from the Quran. Now the azan, which is a call to prayer, is also sometimes read. And by the way, if you didn't know, exorcisms that are conducted in the religion of Islam are part of a larger body of Islamic alternative medicine called prophetic medicine.